Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about the recent changes in enforcement that the FDA is looking at in the context of drugs, CBD, and vaping, and how that impacts um, these products, and how that impacts how um, each of these companies needs to potentially look at their products to be compliant. This is the Darshan Talks Podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com. So let's, let's take a look back at what the FDA's requirements are. FDA requires two things and then requires that you not do two things. Generally speaking, depending on the product, the FDA requires that your product must be safe, it must be efficacious, so it must be effective. Um, what it must not be is adulterated or misbranded. And each one of those four words has literally had books written about them. So there's a lot of information out there, but each of those words is incredibly important. Typically speaking, again, I'm speaking in broad strokes. The typical scope of jurisdiction is drugs, devices, biologics, food, cosmetics, nicotine and tobacco, and pharmacy right now. Um, typically speaking, they're looking at manufacturers and service providers of manufacturers or to manufacturers, and they're basing their jurisdiction based on intended use of the product. So what is intended use? Intended use is determined based on the objective intent of the persons legally responsible for the labeling of the drugs. The intent is determined by such persons' expressions or maybe shown by the circumstances surrounding the distribution of the article. So again, it's not just the label you stick on your product, it is also what accompanies the product, what you say with the product, the advertisement that goes with the product, the types of claims people that you have hired are making associated with your product, what your website says about the product, etc., etc., etc. If you go back and look um, between between 2009 and 2014, there were multi-billion dollar fines that pharmaceutical companies paid. Um, you had Lilly that paid a 1.42 billion dollar fine. You had Johnson & Johnson in 2013 paid a $2.2 billion fine. GSK, GlaxoSmithKline paid a $3 billion fine, all because of non-compliant um, advertising. And because um, it, it all came in through the context of intended use and what, and what they were saying didn't match what the product was approved for. Um, there were then a series of court cases. There was the IMS v. Sorrell case. There was a U.S. v. Coronia case. There was the Amarin v. U.S. FDA case. The Pacera case. There, the Medical Information Working Group put out three different citizens' petitions. The FDA then responded with different guidances and even put out a 63-page position statement or, or a memorandum, really, uh, putting out what their thoughts were. Here's where the general impact was. Here's where it landed up, if you will. Intended use not approved by the FDA may not be wholly dispositive of whether criminal, civil, or administrative penalties are warranted. Now that's the only take as it applies to intended use. So that the idea of intended use being a huge determining factor has diminished in value. And the FDA is still determining what that actually means. However, people have taken that to mean that they can speak off label. And that's where problems start coming up. Um, Let's, let's keep looking at the impact on the FDA a little bit further before we start talking about what the impact on the companies themselves will be. So in 1998, the division of the FDA used to be called DDMAC, um, that used to look at drug enforcement, put out 156 letters talking to companies, explaining why they had problems uh, in their promotional efforts and they, that they needed to fix them. Um, that went down uh, by 2008 to about 21 different um, 21 different warning letters, if you will. Uh, it peaked back up in 2010 to about 52, but in uh, 2019, you have had so far, you've, well, let's, let's go back to 2017. In 2017, you have five. So you went from 156 to five. And that's hugely problematic um, because the FDA sort of lost what its core function is going to look like, and they didn't know how to readapt in a world where um, off-label promotion may be okay. Um, however, there's been a little bit of an uptick. Um, in 2017, there was five. 
in 2018, there were seven. Again, not a huge number. But in the last three months, in May 2019, June 2019, and July 2019, we've already had one warning letter each month. That is a significant number when you compare that to the history of the FDA previously, where you've essentially seen the number of warning letters just die down. So what has changed? Um, former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb is out, Acting Commissioner Ned Sharpless is in. At the same time for vaping, um, you basically now have what's being referred to as a vaping epidemic. And what you're seeing is influencers, um, these companies using social media to connect with influencers. Um, in, in addition, um, the FDA proposed and the court accepted that a 2022 deadline be preponed to only 10 months from uh, June 2019 to submit a bunch of applications. So now there's this vaping epidemic um, is causing problems in the types of promotional compliance efforts and the submission efforts that these companies are going to have to take on. And then when you look at CBD hearing, there was a CBD hearing on May 31st, 2019, uh, that was primarily in response to the 2018 Farm Bill. And 500 people attended in person, 800 people registered to join, on join online, and over 100 speakers presented on the topic. Dr. Amy Abernathy, FDA Principal Deputy Commissioner, emphasized that it can take between three to five years to complete even an expedited notice and comment rulemaking process that complies with, that complies with the Administrative Procedures Act. Completing a rulemaking requires the agency to develop a robust record to support the rulemaking and include economic analysis and to consider public comments, which can be voluminous when rulemaking con uh, concerns substantive topics for which there's extensive public interest, as in the case of CBD. So, we, we had all these things that were causing potential changes, including the CBD hearing. So let's look at look at each one. We just talked about how there was some, there's a potential rise in uh, in enforcement efforts around drugs. Uh, in the case of nicotine, um, the FDA worked with the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, and sent letters to Solace Vapor, Hype City Vapors, Humble Juice Company, and Artist Liquid uh, Labs. And these companies paid social media influencers to pitch their nicotine solutions. Their flavors included things like watermelon patch and strawberry kiwi. Uh, and the post didn't include a mandatory warning that the vaping liquids contained nicotine, which is addictive, and that was required. Um, additionally, you had companies like Juul that are being targeted for engaging with influencers. And now the FDA and actually uh, several courts, uh, sorry, and several attorneys are actually looking at the marketing practices of these vaping companies to evaluate whether they were compliant with the FDA's requirements. On the other hand, uh, for CBD, the Committee on Appropriations came out and said that the committee expects the FDA to assert its commitment to identifying lawful federal regulatory pathway for, pathways for CBD foods and dietary supplements if such pathways are consistent with protection for the public health. Such pathways may include necessary public health and safety parameters that will protect the public health, such as labeling requirements, and limits on CBD or other cannabis-derived ingredients and products based on anticipated total exposure levels. The committee also expects the FDA to preserve the integrity of its drug development and approval processes, which ensures that products marketed for drug uses have undergone a rigorous scientific validation process that demonstrates quality, safety, and efficacy. Which is interesting, because technically, if CBD is a food, it's interesting that you require an efficacy analysis. It also is imperative that any FDA regulation of foods and dietary supp supplements containing CBD or other cannabis-derived ingredients preserve incentives to invest in robust clinical study of cannabis so that its therapeutic value can be fully understood. So the Committee on Appropriations essentially came out and said that they need to, the FDA needs to speed up the process. So even though Dr. A uh, Amy Abernathy acknowledged that it may take uh, between three to five years uh, to get a regulatory process. Given the strong public interest in, help, in hemp and CBD products, the agency is exploring options to reach a resolution quickly and efficiently. In light of all of this um, interest, on July 23, 2019, Curaleaf got a FDA warning letter. It said that uh, Curaleaf illegally sold an unapproved cannabidiol products online with unsubstantiated claims. Amongst the claims made by the company was that the products could treat cancer, Alzheimer's disease, opioid withdrawal, pain and pet anxiety, amongst other conditions. This isn't even the first time 
that the FDA has warned uh, CBD or uh, THC, well, CBD producers. In on February 4, 2016, Green Garden Gold warning letter, uh, Gold, uh, Green Garden Green Garden Gold received a warning letter, and they were trying to promote their CBD product for anti-inflammatory, uh, for as an anti-inflammatory, anti-pain, anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic, and/or as anti-spasm effects. Um, they went out and claimed that it had scientific that they had scientific and clinical studies that underscored. CBD's potential as a treatment for a wide range of conditions, including arthritis, diabetes, alcoholism, uh, MS, chronic pain, schizophrenia, uh, PTSD, antibiotic resistant infections, or other neurological disorders. And uh, additionally, they actually, that same warning letter uh, identified that uh, Green Garden Gold claimed that its anti, the C CBD's anti cancer properties are being investigated at several academic, center, uh, academic research centers in the US and elsewhere. Um, on November 1st, 2017, so in addition to the 2016 uh, letter, on November 1st, 2017, uh, warning letters were sent to four companies, including Green Roads, Green Roads Health, Natural Alchemist, that's Natural Marketing and Consulting, and Stanley Brothers Social Enterprises, LLC. They were making claims like the combats, combats tumor and cancer cells, CBD makes cancer cells commit suicide without killing other cells, CBD has anti-proliferative properties that inhibit cell division and growth in certain types of cancer, not allowing the tumor to grow, and that it has uh, that the non-psychoactive cannabinoids like CBD may be effective in treating tumors from cancer, including breast cancer. Essentially, these these groups, these uh, producers, were making CBD treatment claims that would not be supported by the evidence that they actually had. So, what are the takeaways? What we're really seeing is that the FDA is changing its overall enforcement priorities. Um, on one hand, uh, Amy Abernathy has already come out and said that they cannot wait, that can't wait long enough to develop a CBD guidance. That uh, we already, we are already seeing an uptick in nicotine promotional compliance oversight and enforcement. And there's also an uptick in prom uh, drug promotion enforcement. And you're also seeing a general uptick in promotional enforcement. So what we're seeing is that the FDA is likely solidifying its attitude towards off-label promotion. And it's likely going to be solidifying oversight and claims for CBD and vaping as well. So what does this mean for a company that is engaged in promotion for any one of these products? Um, you need to have a quality promotional, uh, you need to have a quality system built in for promotional compliance. Um, you need to build quality into your process by design. Um, some people will also need to have some type of audit process. Most people probably need to have some kind of audit process. Drug companies do this by having what's referred to as an MLR process. Um, and that basically means some uh, medical, legal, and regulatory review to review the potential claims being made. In my specific instance, I happen to have all three backgrounds. I happen to have a, um, I happen to be an attorney who has a doctor in pharmacy and also am, um, also a master in quality assurance, assurance regulatory affairs. So I can comment on all, each of these. However, the key piece being that someone needs to either individually or with groups of people review these processes. Additionally, you need to take an additional step of ensuring that if there's a problem, a root cause analysis be looked at to evaluate whether a CAPA, corrective or preventative action, is being met. And then on addition, in addition to that, if there are problems, you need to have a warning letter response team that also comes into play. And we can discuss each one of these individually eventually. Stay tuned, listen in, subscribe. I'm going to have more information for you as you continue. This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com.